Uh, we're still in this earliest period of the church. Um, and let's begin now with a, uh, a short prayer. Father, we ask your blessing of peace upon the United States and free us from the, the plague of murders and violence that is sweeping the country today. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Okay. Um, as, as time went on in the churches, now remember the way the churches were constructed at the time, um, they had a, uh, an altar in the center and people were standing and they would gather around the altar. Well, what happened was the, uh, the altar was separated from the people. Why was the altar separated from the people? Largely because you were getting larger crowds. So in, in a crowded area that you just couldn't have them packed around. So it was separated. And once it was separated, and this is true of liturgy all the time, that, that magical things happen in liturgy. And one of the magical things that happened was once they separated it, they began to call the area where the altar was the sanctuary. That was the first time that use came in. If you go into a pagan temple, the entire inside of the temple is called the sanctuary. Okay? Many Protestant churches will refer to their church as the sanctuary rather than the church. And, um, but it came to be just the area around the altar and the people that were, would normally gather around had to be kept away because they couldn't be in the sanctuary. So they were moved outside the sanctuary. And um, an, an exam another example of this sort of thing was it, it, masses normally were what we used to know as high mass, and they would involve the use of incense. And as soon as the priest finished using incense, he would go over and wash his hands. And then he would go on with the mass with obvious reason. He'd, he'd just uh, used the incense. But over a period of time, the washing of the hands became connected with Pontius Pilate's washing his hands before the crucifixion of Jesus. So when we stopped using the incense, we still kept the washing of the hands because the symbolism was there. So that's what I mean by magical things happen. When you do something in lit liturgy, you have no idea how it will be perceived or seen or what will happen as a result of it. Now, by the fourth century, women were excluded from the sanctuary. And by the fifth, the pathway to the altar, what we'd call the main aisle, was open only to the clergy. People had to come in and go in from the sides, this sort of thing. And <clears throat> what we saw was as soon as we began to move into churches out of the home church, as soon as we began to move, men were in charge of it. And as soon as men were in charge of it, then a whole thing began to take place that moved women further and further away. And uh, that trend was only reversed by Vatican II. That trend went on, as I mentioned, when I, was, uh, when I was first ordained, when I said mass in a convent, none of the sisters could come on the altar to, uh, to help me like a server. They had to do it outside the communion rail. It was, it was just really a, a, a crazy thing. Anyway, by the fourth century, women were excluded from the sanctuary, and by the fifth, only the clergy could use what we would call the center aisle. By the fourth century, there was very clear directive that Christian churches were to be orientated to the east. Now, this is a very curious thing, because when we study this, and this is around the time of Constantine, when we study this, one of the things about Constantine was Constantine before he, you know, uh, before the Battle of the Milvian Bridge. Constantine actually was a part of a cult in Rome that worshiped the sun. So he worshiped the sun before he came. And it's, it's very interesting that what appeared to him before the Battle of the Milvian Bridge was a circular disc with the key row on it and rays coming up. Now that's the sun. And so when he became, you know, the emperor and the church began to grow under him, then churches had to be orientated to the east, 
which is where you face the rising sun. Um, this orientation, incidentally, is not true in the earliest basilicas, like St. Peter's in Rome or St. John Lateran, which became the cathedral church of the entire church. To this day, people always think of St. Peter's as our cathedral. St. Peter's is actually the private chapel of the Pope over the tomb of St. Peter. And St. John Lateran is the church that was presented to the first Pope who was free, Sylvester. Sylvester I was given the palace of the Lateran family, and he turned the dining room into the church. That's St. John Lateran's today. And that is the cathedral of the Roman Catholic Church. When the Pope does official things, he does them in St. John Lateran. The throne of the Bishop of Rome is in St. John Lateran, as I mentioned, the Cathedral of Rome and the world. And where St. Peter is buried, St. Peter's is called a martyr church. And as soon as the, um, what do you call it, the uh, freedom of the church came up, they began to move the bodies of martyrs out of the catacombs and into the churches up above. I mentioned that before. But when they did that, they were known as martyrum churches, that they honored a martyr. And like in St. John's, St. John Lateran, St. John isn't buried there. St. John is buried in Ephesus. There, uh, there is no, uh, no tomb there or anything. That was truly a church. But St. Peter's is one of these martyriums. Um, old St. Peter's has been altered and rebuilt many times over the centuries. But a renovation under Pope Gregory in order to place the altar exactly over the tomb of St. Peter led to the raising of the altar six feet higher and the dropping the floor two feet to allow a door down to the tomb. So we have St. Peter's built over the uh, tomb of St. Of Peter. Now, Gregory, the tomb of St. Peter's like here and the main altar and everything's here, Gregory wanted the main altar on top of the tomb because people would go behind the altar and visit. So what they did was raise this whole thing six feet to put the tomb up here. But six feet isn't tall enough for a door for someone to go down, so they lowered this two feet. And now we have a door. And if you visit St. Peter's today, you'll notice the altar is up here. The seating is down here. And there's this big area right in front of St. Peter's. You go down. Right in front of the high altar, you go down, there's steps around, and the tomb of Peter is actually directly under the high altar now. And Gregory did that. Gregory was probably the pope who was most interested in the whole business about Simon Peter and the, uh, the papacy coming from Simon Peter. There was a sad effect of this, and I think of it now, what he wanted to do simply was to put this altar directly above the tomb. So that, that's kind of how he did it. The architect did it. But the effect of this now is the altar has been raised higher away from the people. So you see what we've been watching. We've been watching from the earliest days now the altar is moving away. And this, uh, this altar we have here is a rather typical example of what descends from that. We have steps that go up that set the altar above the congregation so that the congregation can see it. You know, the newer churches today, the brand new ones, reverse that. The altar is usually on a flat, and the, the seating rises so that they can all see the altar. But if we watch at this point, the altar is uh, moving higher. The altar, rather than being the place the people would gather around, now became a stage, and the people would view it from where they were seated. So notice we have moved from, uh, uh, I, I guess if I were to use the example, I would say, we have moved from an intimate family dinner to a formal occasion. I don't know if you've ever been to a formal dinner. I, I may have mentioned this here, but uh, years ago, I was in Canada studying at the University of Ottawa when the Queen of England visited Canada. And so, the, she was going to have a uh, dinner in the American Embassy, and the American Embassy wanted a lot of Americans there. 
So the major amount of Americans up there were the ambassadors and the students. So we all got an invitation. And the invitation was to an instruction. When we went to the instruction, they explained to us that you never touch the queen. Uh, you talk about what she talks about. You don't direct the conversation. How you use the silverware. And, and everyone stops eating when she does. Everyone starts eating when you get your plate. They serve her first. She starts eating. But by the time everyone's at, you, you start when you get your plate. But everyone stops when the queen stops eating. So, I mean, the, the, all this stuff was explained. If you didn't go to the instruction, you didn't get the invitation to the dinner itself. So we went. And to be honest, it wasn't much fun. You had to be too careful about what fork you were using and how you were doing it. And this, and when you stop, and this sort of thing. It was just, it was a disaster. I'd have rather gone to McDonald's. But the, um, the idea is that's what we've done to the mass. The Mass up to this point is a gathering of people around a table where they converse and celebrate the wonder of Jesus Christ and talk about him and this sort of thing. And now it's people sitting in a congregation watching a show on the altar. And that will change things radically in how the buildings go on. This period saw the development of other buildings. And again, if you go to, to Europe, Probably one of the most famous ones of these is in Florence. But the room in which the baptism took place was not the church. So you had a church and then you had a baptistry. It's very common today in older churches to have a place at the side or in the back where the baptismal font is sort of enshrined and baptisms would take place there. If you look at many of the missions, a good example is San Juan Batista. Um, Right near the entrance to the church, there is a baptismal thing. And I'll tell you something liturgically about this. The church would like to have the baptistry up at the altar largely because of the Easter Vigil, where you can watch people being baptized. But since we normally baptize babies, the idea is it should be the door because it presents their, represents their entering the church. Catechumens actually enter the church when they begin the catechumenate. They're considered part of the church then, unbaptized. So they, they have the two things. You're not allowed to have two baptismal fonts in a church. And so what you end up doing is making a compromise. I saw a church, I think the church was in, um, might have been Holland or Finland, but there was, it was a Catholic church. There was a large baptismal uh, pool right in front of the altar. You could get in, get out, that sort of thing. Steps in one side, out the other. And the water under a glass thing flowed down the center aisle into a baptismal font at the door. So technically it was one baptismal, but they could do children and adults that way. Um, there's a church in uh, Israel that was excavated probably only about 25 years ago. And in that church, it was built for the Easter Vigil. The church was built for the Easter Vigil. And you have the regular seating and stuff that you would come in. But there is a deep font with steps in and out here. And behind the altar, if you go back behind the altar, there are changing rooms so that people could go back. You would come in this side, get baptized, go out that side, go back to the changing room, get dressed. It was put in. And that dated from about the seventh century, I think. Um, the Romans had a tradition of building round mausoleums. And this probably accounted for the design of the first of the outer buildings to be built because they were largely to house martyrs. I told you about the martyrium. If you had a church then, they oftentimes would put a building outside with the martyrium. And because the martyrium is actually a tomb where the thing, the martyriums were circular. And again, if you ever go to Rome, Castle uh, San Angelo, which is that large circular building, you cross a bridge with angels all over. That building actually was the formal mausoleum for the Roman emperors. And they were buried in that. And it's now one of the, uh, it's actually a fortress where the Pope can escape in case of 
something happening in, in Rome. But uh, so the, uh, these other buildings tended to be circular. And again, the baptistry in Florence and many of the baptistries were built outside the churches then were built circular. So the baptismal wasn't in the church at all um, at that time. Um, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem is for obvious reasons the most famous circular church because it is the most famous tomb which is the remains of the tomb of Jesus. If you go into that church, you'll find out that there's a circular thing in the center. And I forget what it was called. There was a specific name for it. But there was, there's a circular thing. In the center of it is the remains of the tomb of Jesus inside a small building. And outside here, you have a church for the Roman Catholics, a church for the Greek Catholics, a church for the Russian uh, I mean, for the Greek Orthodox, the Russian Orthodox, Armenian, Coptics, it's just they have all these individual things but go off. But the center area is where the tomb is. And they designate it during the day. Each denomination has a certain amount of time in the center. The largest amount of time, the two big blocks of time, go to the Greek Orthodox because that's the bishop in that area. That is largely a Greek Orthodox parish and the other, the Roman Catholic, because there are lots of Rome. If you go in there, there's virtually always, during the Catholic period, and I, I think, if I remember correctly, we had the tomb from 3.30 a.m. till uh, 7. And then from 7 on, a couple of hours, it was the Greek Orthodox, and then it divided up the others. But they keep a block of time open too, for the pilgrims to go in. But during the Roman Catholic time, and you know, our liturgy, uh, when you went in to say Mass there, you had one half hour. And so at the liturgies would go one after another right there. You had to make reservations, everything for them, to the say Mass inside the tomb itself. And the most people you could have in there was eight, most people you could have with you. These shrines with the remains of martyrs were called martyria. Because of the connection of the burial of Jesus and the symbolism of the immersion of the convert into the water and rising from the water a Christian, it would seem natural that the design for the martyrium would then be the design for the baptismal, okay? Because the baptismal is conceived as uh, a celebration actually of the resurrection of Jesus. If you've never heard it before, the, um, in the, the uh, Triduum, the High Holy Days, um, one of the things that's peculiar is we act out the, the service. So um, on uh, Holy Thursday, we celebrate the Last Supper, and then we wash people's feet, because Jesus washed people's feet at that. On Good Friday, Good Friday commemorates the crucifixion of Jesus, but the finding of the true cross, they went and dug up lots of crosses, they found them there, and St. Helena, and she invited the people of Jerusalem to come forward and touch the crosses. And one of the crosses, a number of people were cured at that, and that became known as the relic of the true cross. That particular cross is the one where the pieces of the true cross come from, that one. But we enact that during Good Friday. People all come up and touch the cross in the front. And on Easter Sunday, which is the third thing, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, and the way we do it is by baptisms. Because in a baptism of Christian, the resurrection of Jesus is repeated. We rise out of the water uh, new people. So this, uh, this is uh, used in that way. Um, Although um, there were some focus buildings being built for churches, focus buildings are long, like this is a focus building. Although there were focus buildings being built by churches, in the West, the long shape of the basilica came to be pre the preferred design. Okay, rather than have the altar in the center, we had this design, the church focused on the altar. One reason for this might be the introduction of long processions into the liturgy as the ceremonies took on more and more imperial overtones. Um, 
if you if you study uh, well you would see this you watch it with the British royalty um, if you have a, uh, a what do you call it a wedding we've, we've seen several royal weddings or something you notice it's a big thing to have whoever moves in the carriage we call that kind of a parade here but to go into the church and that's a big public thing as they go out but those are processions and processions are a big part of any royal thing. It's what royal people do. And so as a result of that, and the emperor's court and everything, the church took on a lot of these qualities or backgrounds or whatever of the, uh, of the court. And when they took it on, one of the things they took on were processions. And a long building like this is great for a procession. You know, when I was uh, first in the seminary in San Diego, I was put on the, uh, uh, what do you call it, the Master of Ceremonies team, and would end up Master of Ceremonies after about four years. I was the, the Master of Ceremonies for the bishop and the seminary after that. But in the beginning, the first thing I did as the youngest MC, I actually carried the train of the bishop. And the bishop in San Diego he would be three quarters the way up the aisle before I entered the back door. The train was really a long train. And those are the things, processions, you know, if you have a small church, you couldn't even, I would still be outside while the mass was going on. So they, they would have these, these very, very long buildings. One adaptation that seemed to unite the central focus and the basilica design was a cross form with the altar in the center of the cross of the aisles and a dome right over the altar. And that's what we see in, uh, like for instance, it, for this design to be that way, the altar would have to be a little more forward. We'd have to have another arm out here, another arm at the back. But they used a Latin cross. Now a Latin cross, the bottom part is longer. So this would be long. The part behind the altar was shorter, and then the two sides were shorter. With the shape of what we generally call a cross in our church. But a Greek cross, they're equilateral, like the red cross is a Greek cross. And the Greeks tended to go more with that, while we tended to have this long area for the imperial processions. And, and that became uh, probably the, the, the norm. The big churches that we know around the world as famous churches were built under that. The altar is kind of in the center and the church itself is cruciform. I think of that with um, Notre Dame in Paris, the uh, Basilica of the Immaculate Conception in Washington, D.C. That, that, that's, that is the probably most common form. The West, the central plan embodies a communal attitude to the liturgy and the Basilica embodied Embodied, embodied a hierarchical thing. So in, in the early days, there was community. We gathered around the altar and this sort of thing. But it, in, in a church today, you would find out there's a specific chair uh, back behind me. There is a specific chair for the celebrant, okay? There are two smaller chairs for priests that are assisting him. There are chairs at the side for servers. Their chairs down below reserved for the choir, and then people go off in the other areas. But there's this hierarchical thing where everyone knows. Whereas I, I think you know when a, when a family, yeah, uh, probably when a family gathers for Thanksgiving, there's a hierarchical structure. There's someone in the center, and that's kind of worked out, but it gets weaker the further down you get, okay? And, but in, in a, uh, a regular gathering, people just, you know, like at a picnic, just take their places or something. Um, in the East, there was a whole different attitude to the liturgy. When we consider the East, what we're considering is the Greeks as different from the Romans, okay? Now, they, they were all Greek culture, but the Greek church, the Roman church, were kind of separated. Constantine built a second capital in the east, and he called it Constantinople. 
and then named it after himself, and then Rome. So these became two sides to the empire. And the East was in the East, while the liturgy was seen as an invitation for the Christian to enter the heavenly, the life of the heavenly spirits for a time, Western liturgy was a celebration of the Lord among us. I think I've, I've talked about this before, but an example would be if you ever go into the Sistine Chapel in Rome, uh, you'll see that there is a, a sanctuary, as we mentioned, sanctuary, and there's a wall. The wall is about four feet high, and then it has a, a railing on top of it you, that you can see through. And so that was sort of the way the churches were. Once the East and the West began to separate, the East saw the liturgy as what goes on in heaven coming down among us on earth and us being invited in to participate in the heavenly liturgy. Well, as a result of that, they had this four foot thing grow to the ceiling, become a wall. And so the liturgy now takes place behind a wall in the Greek churches. Now there are doors and stuff so you can see in there, but it's really a wall, it's covered with icons, and back there the liturgy takes place. It's the heavenly liturgy, and you're invited to look in and have see, you know, see it that way. The Latin church, we celebrate the liturgy, not us going up to God's kingdom, but Jesus entering our kingdom. And so we tend to have the liturgy down among the people and very open so that everyone can see what's going on. Uh, no uh, secret or anything. Um, one of the most important changes in churches from this point on is that during the time of the persecution, churches were not designed for the non-Christian to view the ceremonies. But with the public acceptance of the Christian community, churches were built for as many people who might want to view the ceremonies, whether or not they were members of the church. In the earliest days, there were, uh, what do you call it, uh, blockades set up so that no one could come in who wasn't a member of the church. Why? We didn't want to be identified if a persecution broke out. So you didn't want non-Christians to know that you were here. Once the church became legal, we wanted them to see the ceremonies so that maybe they'd be inspired to join and become a part of it as, as we have this today. So churches became much more open. Presiders came to look more and more to the light of the imperial court officials. And in art, Jesus came to look more and more like the emperor or the king, okay? Now, if we go back to the earliest days of the church, we would find that the depictions of Jesus are virtually always the good shepherd. So they always view Jesus as a good shepherd. Once we enter this period, then they begin to see Jesus as king of kings. And so we see the whole cult of Jesus as king. Once the Roman Empire forbids crucifixion, so that's no longer a public thing, then you'll begin to see crucifixes come in. But crucifixes are not, you know, at the beginning. At the beginning is the good shepherd, then Jesus as king. So this time they wanted to show Jesus as, as king. And uh, finally, by the fourth century, the word basilica would come to mean a church. Uh, you remember at the beginning, I mentioned that basilica was a specific design of a building. If you say basilica today to an architect, he will immediately think church. He will not think of the particular design, okay? And remember the design is sort of a long thing with the back wall curved, and that's basically a basilica design. Worship now affects music and is both at the same time affected by this music. And this period will find the rise of the acoustics of a building. And because music became so important, um, there's, there's a, a real interest in the acoustics of a building. Uh, I, I speak as a pastor. One of the most difficult things about a church is the acoustics. 
And I'll give you an example of a church in the city of Jerusalem. It's called St. Anne's. It is a very, very ancient church. It was there long before the Crusades. The Muslims used it as a school when they were there. And then at a certain point, they donated it to the White Fathers, which are a religious order that worked uh, in Muslim countries, um, not for conversion, but to educate the people and take care of medical needs and stuff. So they're highly regarded by the Muslims. But the Muslims returned this church to them. It's a fascinating church. If I were to take 10 people, let's say I have a tour. Tour was about 40 people. So I'd take 40 people, we would go in. If they sang, they sounded like the Sistine Choir. And it was because of the way sound reflects off the inside. You've, I don't care who you are, you could have sold records if you did it in there. It's just wonderful. But if you try and talk to people, it doesn't work at all. You hear echoes and everything off. Now remember, our liturgy is the singing, the prayers, and the readings. So historically, and that's true today, there's some churches that are so magnificent to listen to singing in, everyone wants to do a concert in that church. It sounds, sounds better. But they are not the churches in which you hear the best preaching. One of the, uh, one of the things that we do now, this is a church that is constructed for singing just the way it resonates and sound bounces off. This church is built for that. So what do we do? When we have concerts here, you don't really need the sound system. But the church resonates, it's beautiful. But if you want to talk to the people, you need a sound system. And so we're able some way to juggle that. But as I told you, that's the worst problem in any church I've ever been in, is trying to get something that both shows off the, uh, the music and at the same time will, uh, will be a good place to, to read and preach and that sort of stuff. At this point in history, all public speaking was musical or lyrical to some degree. Um, it, it's an interesting thing to me. Um, I, I have a horrible time with memorization. Okay, and it's because of the dyslexia. I have a difficult time reading, I have horrible times of memorization. But you know, it's easy for me to memorize poetry. And it's easy for me to memorize uh, words of a song or something like that. And one of the reasons is they're lyrical. They flow in a set way. Psalms are easy for me to remember. They just flow in a set way. Well, in the ancient world, everyone spoke that way. If you were a public speaker, you spoke very lyrically. And we have, let's say, the, uh, the speeches that Cicero gave. And we have a lot of famous Roman and Greek orators, and we have documents of how they spoke. And, and you can just hear it. And, and probably the best example we know in, in the Catholic Church is the, uh, in St. Augustine. If you just listen, even in English, you can kind of hear it. He says, uh, you have made us for yourself, our hearts are restless till they rest in thee. Okay? Think, St. Augustine just speaks in this way, that, but he was a public speaker, so it was lyrical. And it, it makes it uh, easier to remember. In the, the church building, um, cantillating moved closer and closer to song. Cantillating is speaking in this lyrical voice. And this lyrical way of speaking then began to move more and more closer to song. And although musical notation would not be developed until later, and the living memory of these pieces of music has been lost, chants give us a good example of what was going on. So they, they, would, they created music, but until music notation, which actually is relatively recent in history, until me, uh, that was created, there was no way to record music. Like they, they could obviously didn't have recordings, but you couldn't read music. That you just had to you know hear it, remember it. And the music that was used at these earliest times has really been lost. But the way it went was chants. If you listen to the monks, for instance, chant the office, what you're hearing is this 
this way of cantillating and becomes more and more musical the way it's developed. By the fourth century, the lector, that's one who, who read during liturgy, the lector had become an established ministry like bishop or priest and included leading music and many lectors served in the churches over a long period of time. And if the same lector served for a long time, it allowed a development of a particular style and collection of music. If you go to uh, different uh, ch two churches here at Old Mission and the other church in town is Nativity, you'll hear a very different style of music and that's because the leader in music here in uh, the mission was classically trained in Rome and she understands liturgical music but this, this uh, formal liturgical music and, and beautiful pieces. They aren't necessarily pieces you've heard. Like they, a lot of them are not pieces that you would hear a congregation sing but they're very, very beautifully composed uh, pieces, much more formal. At Nativity, the training was done, the, uh, the man who's in charge of the liturgy there was trained in a, a more contemporary music. And his music, is, is, he likes to use music that is deep and profound in meaning and stuff like this. And he's much more interested in the meaning than he is actually in the sound. Although a very beautiful music, but it's a very different style. And um, the man at Nativity has been leading music, I think for a little over 20 years, not at Nativity, but he's been leading music. He has a very defined style. And the woman who leads the music here has a very defined style. Well, if you had the particular music in a parish, let's say for 20 years, that parish would have a defined style. Okay, today, uh, because pastors are changed, uh, in, I think in our diocese about every 12 years, but because pastors are changed at about that rate, you don't get a chance to develop a very particular style because different pastors have different ideas with regards to music. And oftentimes, like the pastor again at Nativity has for over 20 years moved that musician with him when he moves. And that's, so they have a set style the musician does, but doesn't establish in a parish. Changes in the design of the churches at this time show the rise of the lector. And as the uh, lector becomes more and more important than uh, what we would call the ambo or the, the pulpit, the lectern moves into the sanctuary as the altar does. The lector just used to get up and read. Now it is a set place and so much so that in the designing of new churches, they refer to one as the altar of the word and the other one as the altar of the Eucharist. And so they're seen as two equal altars of equal importance. Um, the, uh, a new position that appears at this time as form lies is called the psalmist. Now the psalmist, the major music used in the church at the time was the psalms. So the person who did this was called the psalmist. That's what is today's cantor. That becomes the cantor in today. And again, this position at this time is associated with the ambo, so that the musician would, do, would lead the music there. Vatican II wanted really to preserve the altar of the Eucharist and the altar of the word. So under Vatican II's design, the only thing you would ever hear from the ambo is uh, scripture. And so we have the readings, but in the readings, there is the psalm. We call it the responsorial psalm, and that is scripture. So the cantor would go to the ambo in order to go through the responsorial psalm, but the other music would be led from away from the ambo. So the ambo is preserved as the altar of the word since Vatican II. But in the early days, the ambo was shared with the psalmist or the cantor and, and held that position. By the middle of the fourth century, there developed a markedly different pattern for the presentation of the psalms. Unlike the other scripture readings, 
There was an attention to the lyricism of the Psalms and a preference for responsorial form as distinct from reading the Psalm from beginning to end. So when we have at Mass, if a reading from Paul, we lift out the reading. If we have a reading from one of the Gospel accounts, we lift that out. We have a reading from anything, we take out the reading and use it. Incidentally, a piece lifted out like that is called a pericope. So we move it out and we actually read it. We don't do that with psalms. And when we use a psalm, there will be a, a line that is sung by the congregation. And the, the person reading, uh, singing the psalm will sing a piece, then the parish responds, sings a piece, we sing the same response again, sing the piece. That's called a responsorial psalm. It was done back and forth. But in, in all the scriptures, the only place that is done is with the, uh, with the psalms. And I've seen people try and put it in other places in the liturgy. I'll give you an example. On um, the Easter Vigil, one of the first day, things, readings we have is the seven days of creation. So we go through the seven days of creation. And you know, they all end with the exact same thing. And God saw that it was good. So sometimes you'll hear that read and the congregation will respond and God saw it was good as you go through it. But other than that, it was seen at this point, you would find it just in the use of the Psalms. Between the year 313 and 750, the liturgy acquired many of the musical elements of which we're familiar. But the Psalms remained central, and they were chanted at the entrance, at the introduction to the gospel, at the offertory, and at communion. So the Psalms were the major source of music at this time, but we see music developing very, very greatly at this point. The organization, they formed an organization of singers who would accompany particularly the Pope, to papal ceremonies called the Schola Cantorum. Uh, that's a school of singers, okay? Schola Cantorum. And uh, most seminaries have a Schola Cantorum that will accompany the bishop wherever the bishop goes, that they, they are trained in this particular uh, mode of music. And the Schola Cantorum in Rome, the spoke Pope Schola Cantorum, set about composing a complete set of mass propers, proper music and proper readings for the mass, for all the masses of the entire year, beginning at the first Sunday at Advent. And they did compose Advent and the Christmas season, but that's as far as it went. This work started in the seventh century, but they started, but that was as far as they got at that point. This period also saw the standardization of the Mass. Now, um, the standardization of the ordinary. Uh, I mentioned to you uh, the missiles that came right out of Vatican II sort of were a throwback to the very earliest days. It would give you a prayer, and at the bottom it would say, or in similar words. That or in similar words has been eliminated now. So we go back to the standardization. The prayers are written out. And we're gonna see later on, one of the reasons for writing out the prayers is because there is not a lot of knowledge about the importance of the way the prayers are said. And um, once you begin to study theology, uh, you notice that you have to be very careful how you pray, okay? We know that there is only one God. So you have to be very careful when you talk about the Trinity, you don't end up talking three gods. At the same time, we know there are three persons in the Trinity, and very often you'll hear someone speak of the person of God. There isn't a person of God, there are three persons of God. And so that the, they wanted the language to reflect the theology. And oftentimes it's very technical. I'll give you another example of this. Uh, when someone has a, uh, a vision, this happened here in San Luis Obispo, someone uh, was having visions. 
And so the bishop asked me to examine the, uh, the thing of the visions. Well, one of the things that the woman who was having the visions did, and uh, they request you do this, is to write down exactly what the vision says to you, okay? And the very first thing you look at with regards to a, uh, a person who claims to have a vision, you look at the transcriptions of what is said. Because if, like if it's actually an apparition of the Virgin Mary, she's never gonna say something that contradicts the scriptures. She's never gonna say something that contradicts doctrine. And so that's the very first thing you do. Incidentally, just to complete the story, when the bishop asked me to do that, so I got in contact with the woman and was speaking to her, and I found out something wonderful. And what I found out was, while she's in our area, her visions were actually taking place on the other side of the river in Santa Maria. So she was actually in the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. So I mailed all the material south. And I guess uh, they had to read it, okay? Um, so, so they began to watch these, uh, these very, very carefully. Um, the, the curie that we use actually originated as part of the imperial ceremony with regards to the emperor. Like this, Lord have mercy, it was speaking to the emperor in the, the thing, and then eventually came to be for us, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. And it came into our liturgy actually in Greek, because Greek was spoken in the court, even when the church began to use Latin. Um, one of the problems in the early church, and we mentioned earlier about the beginning of Latin in the church, but one of the problems in the church was sort of the bilingual thing. There were Christians who spoke Greek, like the, in Rome and stuff like that, and there were Christians who spoke Aramaic, the ones who came out of the Mideast. And so the ceremonies were in these two languages, which made it very difficult, as anyone who has Spanish and English liturgies in their parish would know today. So what did the church do? It abandoned those two languages and started using Latin. And that way Latin could be used, as, as I like to say, vindictively. Rather than using a language either one understood, they picked one no one could understand, and then went on and used that, okay? Um, it was present in the um, uh, liturgy in the East by the fourth century, and by the eighth century, it was sung by the choir in papal masses. And it, again, if you ever go to a, a Greek Orthodox or a Greek Catholic or Byzantine Catholic service, you'll notice it's much more elaborate. And that's because the court in the East, Constantinople, was very elaborate. The city of Constantinople was built from the ground up by the emperor as a religious city, and they called it the city of churches. And so it was built for processions and all this grandeur and everything that would take place there. And that became a part of the church in the East. Okay, why don't we call it here and uh, we will pick it up next week. First thing we're gonna talk about next week is the Gloria, because this is the time the Gloria comes into the liturgy. Thanks very much, appreciate your attention.